Hello, class. Now, even if you're completely new to the idea of the Crusades, you already know that this course is going to intersect in a considerable way with crusading. That's because later this semester, we will study how Occitania as a region, a culture, maybe as a people, became the target of a devastating series of crusade campaigns we now call the Albigensian Crusade. That began uh, in around 1209. Uh, it might be too easy then to imagine that the Occitanian people and culture were mainly the target of crusades and resolutely opposed to the phenomenon. But in fact, the opposite is true. Since 1095, the year in which the first crusade campaign was preached by Pope Urban II at Clermont in the Auvergne, that is in Occitania, the region and its people were thoroughly enmeshed in the movement of penitential religious wars that we call the crusades. So I put together this lecture in order to help review the history and of course, to give some basic outline of what it might mean for the history of Occitan literature and I'll also mention language and culture. Before we proceed, let's first establish what we're talking about when we talk about the Crusades. Just the fact that in 1209, what we're calling a crusade expedition could be directed toward Occitania itself uh, and its people who were Western Europeans um, and at least until very recently had been thought of as followers of the Roman Catholic Church, tells us something very important about crusading. Medieval crusading, as understood today by historians, was a far-reaching phenomenon, and crusading wars could be fought anywhere and against virtually anyone. So what was a crusade? The first and most basic thing to understand is that crusading was a penitential act. The fundamental metaphor associated with crusading is taking up the cross, uh, that's what the word crusade or crozada in Occitan refers to. And it implies the ultimate suffering that uh, Jesus Christ suffered to take away the sins of the world. For the crusader then, taking up the cross was seen as alleviating the awful consequences of their sins by taking the place of any penance that would be enjoined on them for sins that they had confessed. The parallel between the two acts, the crucifixion on the one hand and crusading on the other, is made very explicit in this 14th century image from a Chronicle of the Crusades, which depicts the passion of Christ happening in parallel, even intertwined with crusaders conquering Jerusalem in 1099. In the 12th century, uh, a very great percentage of medieval Latin Christians believed that they lived in lives of sin and error, uh, with members of the military aristocracy feeling that their errors were particularly egregious. Crusading existed along a continuum of behavior that would demonstrate for those people contrition through difficult obligations, in this case, particularly associated with the individual opening themselves up to danger, suffering, and death. In that way, crusading was like a pilgrimage, but in fact, of course, it was much, much more difficult. A definition of crusading that cru historians have developed uh, that's known as the pluralist definition looks like this. What defined uh, this penitential war was not its destination, but its origins and characteristics. Participants were responding to an appeal for action that was promulgated by the Pope and preached by the church. Some of them took crusading vows, they assumed the cross, and incurred an onerous obligation that they could not easily evade. They received valuable privileges of a temporal as well as a spiritual nature. Where crusaders fought depended on the wording of the vows that they had taken, and their legal entitlements were predicated on the papacy's magisterium, its doctrinal authority, and on the church's role as a mediator on the bestowal of God's forgiveness to sinners. Campaigns fought by the Cruci Signati, those signed with the cross, stretched from 1095 as far as the 16th and even the 17th centuries. This, division, this definition was developed by historians to help understand the motivations of the majority of people who undertook crusading expeditions over the course of this long period uh, wherever they were going. What the definition does not do is to help us understand the consequences of crusading, the tremendous violence, uh, the subjugation of whole populations of people, both Christian and non-Christian, and the colonial occupation that resulted from many calls to crusade. In the case of Occitania in the 12th century, we need to deal with the issue of conquest, the subjugation and settlement of territories in the Eastern Mediterranean by Occitan speaking peoples and the role that the Occitan language and culture played in the colonial society of the medieval Mediterranean. To understand all of this, the development of crusading ideology and the Occitanian role in the conquest, we need to start with the first crusade. 
The First Crusade was called by Pope Urban II. Born into a knightly family in Eastern France, Urban had started out as a monk of the great Abbey of Cluny, uh, who were tireless advocates of the grassroots religious revolution, which sought to set apart what was holy and pure from what was secular and defiled. This grassroots religious movement had strong roots in Occitania, where uh, it had been first expressed in the Peace of God movement, a movement to purify holy places and holy people, including the poor and defenseless, from the defilement of oppressive violence. In the summer of the year 1095, Pope Urban II led a massive papal delegation through the Alps to Provence and Eastern Occitania, spending much of his time in the lands claimed by Count Raymond IV of Toulouse as Margrave of Provence. He made his famous speech announcing the First Crusade at a great church council in Clermont. Uh, the council was otherwise devoted entirely to the business of church reform and strengthening the power of the Church of Rome. While we cannot know precisely what he said, it is very likely that he brought the considerable grassroots religious interest in purification and defense of holy places to bear on the contemporary political situation in Jerusalem and the Byzantine Empire, which had recently come under attack from the newly revitalized Sunni Islamic Caliphate of Baghdad, led by the Seljuk Turkish Confederacy. Urban's itinerary took him through the territories of both Duke William IX of Aquitaine, known to us as Guillaume de Petus, the Troubadour, and of Count Raymond IV of Toulouse, who called himself Raymond of Saint-Gilles, to emphasize his holdings in Provence. Of the two, Raymond was the clear favorite of Urban in 1095 because and, and he uh, became one of the most powerful leaders of the expedition that subsequently set off, first for Constantinople and then for Jerusalem. Raymond was accompanied by a large army of followers from all over Occitania, and the southern contingent was buttressed by the presence of Ademar of Le Puy, uh, uh, Ademar uh, of Montai, who was the Bishop of Le Puy. And Ademar was the official papal legate for the expedition, giving the whole crusade a distinctively southern sort of flavor, um, uh, despite the fact that the you know, majority of the participants in the expedition were drawn from other parts of Northern Europe. Another aspect of the Southern dynamic in the First Crusade came from the participation of the Italian trading republics, particularly Genoa and Pisa, who already had very strong links with Occitania through tr trade and through collaboration and joint military campaigns in Spain. While outside observers writing in either Greek or Arabic knew the Crusaders collectively as just the Franks, it seems clear that there was a distinctively Occitan experience that was informed in part by Occitan culture. Tellingly, for instance, after the Occitan contingent arrived in Constantinople uh, in April 1097, the Byzantine Emperor Alexios Komnenos asked Count Raymond IV of Toulouse to swear an oath that had been agreed to by all of the other crusade leaders that he would return whatever lands were conquered uh, to Byzantine control. Uh, so let's look at what, according to uh, Raymond's own chaplain, Raymond Vaguier, happened uh, when the emperor asked him to swear that oath. Um, uh, Raymond Vaguier writes, upon the most honorable reception of Raymond IV of Toulouse by Alexios and his princes, the Basileos, that is the Byzantine emperor, demanded from the count homage and an oath which the other princes had sworn to him. Raymond responded that he had not taken the cross to pay allegiance to another lord or to be in the service of any other than the one for whom he had abandoned his native land and his paternal goods, that is to say, in the Lord Jesus Christ. He said he would, however, entrust himself, his followers, and his effects to the emperor if he uh, would journey to Jerusalem with the army. That's say, if the emperor would come with the crusade. But Alexios, the emperor, uh, temporized by excusing himself. Now, it's interesting, this little story. Oath swearing, as we've seen, comprised a major element in Occitan political culture and meant something quite different than it did uh, in Occitania than it did elsewhere. Accustomed to feudal oaths to be helpful and harmless to allies and friends, Raymond may have balked at this oath of submission and surrender, total surrender of lands um, because that really lay outside of the context of the kinds of oath swearing he was familiar with. Um, Occident Crusaders seem to have been particularly interested in preserving the memory of the experience of their expedition. Uh, so I just mentioned Raymond of Aguier who records the 
the story of the oath to Alexios and who was the chaplain of Raymond IV of Toulouse. Um, and he wrote a chronicle of the expedition, he says, uh, in collaboration with a knight named Pons of Balazun. Um, and that's their work is not only one of the earliest accounts of the expedition, but one that is notably independent of other early sources. Another collaborative Southern work was written in part by the Protestant priest, priest Peter Tudeboat, and gives a, again, a very a clearly explicitly Southern account of the First Crusade expedition. Most important, probably for our purposes, is undoubtedly the Occitan epic of the First Crusade, known as the Canso d'Antioca, uh, written by a knight named Gregory Beixada, which survives only in a single fra fragment but which was clearly significant, considered the authoritative account of the expedition in the South, uh, for instance, in Iberia and Spain, where it served as the basis for the Castilian crusade epic Gran Conquista de Ultramar, uh, which was written in the 13th century. The Occitan Canso was clearly still popular and was actively performed in the first, first quarter of the 13th century, as we will see uh, when we read the verse account of the Albigensian Crusade, the Council of Crusada, um, in which uh, it's explicitly said is written to the melody of um, this council, the Council of Antioch. The Occitan army of Count Raymond uh, of Toulouse comes to the fore a number of times in the history of the expedition. They were the discoverers and the most fervent believers in the relic of the Holy Lance discovered at Antioch on the Orontes in 1098. Uh, Count Raymond himself seems at many times to have been the presumptive overall leader uh, and was definitely the leader most committed to maintaining links with Constantinople. Uh, when he was thwarted in his bid for control of the conquered Syrian coastal city of Antioch, it was his Occitan contingent who seems to have pushed the crusade uh, expedition forwards towards Jerusalem. When Raymond was once again passed over for the title of first Latin ruler of the city of Jerusalem after its conquest by the Crusaders in 1099, he withdrew with his forces to the area of modern Lebanon and began to carve out a territory for himself. Um, now, this wasn't the end of the Occitan participation in the First Crusade because in 1100, a second wave of Occitan Crusaders uh, left, uh, led by the troubadour William IX of Aquitaine, um, but their forces, William's forces, were uh, effectively destroyed and William was captured in Anatolia. Um, uh, although some of members of that expedition did make it uh, to Jerusalem uh, in 1101, uh, they were, uh, this, this, was, this expedition did, didn't play a very significant role in the sort of shaping of the early uh, conquests uh, in Palestine and Syria. So at least at first, it was the House of Toulouse uh, that was most prominent in establishing itself uh, in the lands conquered by the Crusaders. In, in 1109, uh, Count Raymond IV of Toulouse finally conquered Tripoli and established it as the capital of his county. His fortresses, uh, most famously the one known as the Fortress of Saint-Gilles or the Cala uh, Saint-Gilles in Tripoli itself, have recently been shown to reveal extensive and complex aristocratic display spaces and seemed to have been the center of a major princely court. The establishment of the Crusader Principality uh, led by an Occitan dynasty and ruled by their Occitan followers effectively bound the Occitan region with the ongoing project of Crusades to the East. The House of Poitiers actually made a second bid for involvement. In 1136, Raymond, the younger son of William the Ninth of Aquitaine, married Constance, the heiress of Antioch. And the new Poitavan dynasty would rule not only Antioch, but ultimately Tripoli uh, as well, after the death of the last Toulousan prince, Raymond III in 1187. The northern half of the Crusader states then, um, from the middle of the 12th century forwards, all the way until the end of the 13th century, was effectively an Occitan ruled area uh, with very strong links to their home across the sea. So what are the signs of those links? Well, one of the clearest signs of the importance of Occitan involvement in Eastern Crusades and their presence among the European colonial settler population is language. Um, we cannot claim uh, to have much access to the spoken languages of the Crusader states, and they were probably mul multiple, multiplicity of them. Um, but scholars have identified a distinctive written dialect or scripta, as what you call a dialect, it was produced in these lands. Uh, it has many features borrowed from Italian, 
Arabic and Greek, but it has a particularly large influence from Occitan. So you can see on uh, this page that I put up there, um, some examples of the lexical elements that are borrowed from Occitan and you see them in um, the, the language that we call the French of Ultraman. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's noteworthy that uh, when I speak to the scholars or the specialists uh, on this language, on the scripta, um, they say, you know, the first thing they look for when they're looking at a text to determine whether the text, whether they should associate the text with the Crusader States um, is to see whether uh, it, it has these Occitan features. They, they, that's the first kind of go-to thing to look for. Um, so another sign of Occitan connections with the East is the evidence of material culture. Uh, as we saw last week in Carmelis' presentation, two separate church treasuries, Apt and Caduan, uh, Kadua preserved silks that were known to have been produced in Egypt around the time of the First Crusade. And, you know, how they got to Occitania is not clear. It, it could have come through uh, Iberian trade networks, they could have come through the Western Mediterranean, or they could have been spoils of war taken um, by uh, crusaders from the south uh, in the years after the uh, conquest of Jerusalem. Uh, but it's also noteworthy that the Cathedral of Toulouse preserved a major uh, relic of the Holy Cross that was obtained after the First Crusade. And uh, this relic uh, is, is very noteworthy because of the reliquary that it's in, um, which not only contains this very detailed uh, pictorial cycle uh, showing you exactly how it was taken from Jerusalem. You see the city uh, on the side of the screen there is marked as Jerusalem um, and, and who brought it <laughs> and how it was taken by ship um, all the way back to uh, Toulouse, and uh, so not only shows you that in pictures, but it actually has quite a lot of text on it telling you the story, and including names and, and uh, details uh, as well. So it's, this is kind of an extraordinary object uh, connecting uh, Occitania to the conquest and the, the, the shift of material that came out after the conquests. Um, perhaps most important for our class though, um, besides material culture and this evidence of language is, are the interests that the troubadours themselves uh, demonstrate, both in the wider crusading phenomenon and in the political world of the Latin East. A full account of the Occitan lyrics, either referencing crusade ideology, crusade expeditions, or the world of the Latin East is given in uh, Professor Linda Patterson's uh, recent book, Singing the Crusades, French and Occitan Lyric Responses to the Crusade Movement. And we're reading a kind of a Pressy, early Pressy of that work in her article, Occitan Literature in the Holy Land. Fortunately for us, Professor Patterson has also created a website with a database of all the lyrics identified in French and in Occitan with, a full, with full editions of the Occitan lyrics and translations of many of them. In these lyrics, we find a wide range of responses to crusading from meditations on the redemptive power of crusading uh, to, um, you know, uh, uh, the the, what, what it means to undertake the obligation to crusade, um, uh, the implications of crusading for the performance uh, of Finamour, um, and the politics of Tripoli and Antioch. Um, the very project of Professor Patterson and the work of other scholars, including uh, Rachel May Golden and Marissa Galvez, assumes that we can identify particular songs that we classify as crusade songs. Indeed, even particular subgenres, such as departure song, seem to have evolved. But as we've said before, when it comes to these sort of generic divisions, it's really worth looking closely at the classifications we give to the songs and ask what we can discern about the processes and patterns of composition and what that has to do with the material related to crusading. So uh, a final note about troubadours in crusading culture, um, before I move on back to back to the sort of uh, movement of history here, um, I have wondered before, uh, and I've not been contradicted yet. Um, um, I'm, although I'm still waiting for a kind of more robust response, I've wondered about whether we can see the influence of Occitan culture in, in other ways in uh, the Crusader states, the conquered Crusader states. Um, and one way uh, I'll put out there for you is in the identities assumed by women. Uh, in the Crusader States. So 
Like Occitania, uh, the Latin East was a world where women ruled as lords, often for decades. So it was very recognizable to the world of Ermengarde of Narbonne, for instance, uh, whether you're talking about Tripoli or Antioch or Jerusalem itself. Um, and many of the women we come across in uh, uh, the Latin East in the 12th and 13th centuries have very distinctive names uh, that don't seem to be identifiable as part of a pattern of naming you would identify, for instance, with a particular families um, in Western Europe. Uh, they seem to be uh, unique and uh, to the, the, these women themselves in, in, in this Latin Eastern context. Um, and they almost sound like they've been taken directly from romance literature. So they are names, these descriptive names like plaisance uh, or eschiva, which could mean, uh, seems very close to the word for curvy or orgueilleuse, uh, haughty. Um, so what's going on? Were these women's were these these women's given names, um, or were they something that was adopted by the women and by the courts around them? Something more like the Occitan seigneur uh, that we talked about last week. Um, these kind of code names uh, that would arise from the exchange of lyric uh, and from engagement in the sort of phenomore culture. Um, I'd be interested to know your thoughts about what the adoption of these names uh, might mean and whether it has anything to do with um, our subject matter this semester. Okay, so toward the end of the 12th century, when the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem began to collapse uh, in the wake of dynastic crisis and the unification of Syria, Iraq, Sudan, Yemen, and Egypt under Salah al-Din, a new wave of Occitan speaking families inserted themselves onto the scene. Um, initially rivals, uh, the families of Lusignan in Poitou and Montferrat in Piedmont would become involved in all aspects of crusading and the rule of crusader lands from the 1180s through the 1220s. Um, one popular song uh, uh, that circulated in the crusader kingdom in around 1192 is uh, recalled as having said, Mogre Lipolain, uh, Aurons nous re Poitevin. That is to say, uh, despite the wishes of the, um, the, the Frankish population of the Crusader states, uh, we now have a Poitevin king in Jerusalem. Uh, sort of stunning association with uh, the Poitevin identity of the family and their rulership over the sort of uh, uh, local aristocracy of the Crusader states. In 1204, the Marquis Boniface of Montferrat um, uh, uh, was made ruler of Thessalonica. I think we mentioned this last time too, the king of Thessalonica uh, after the Fourth Crusade. In the 13th century, Occitan ports like Marseille uh, and Marpet Montpellier uh, also began to be even more enmeshed in the politics of the Crusader states than they had been before. Uh, in the earlier 12th century, we see this domination by Genoa, Pisa, Venice, uh, Amalfi, places like that. But in the early 13th century, right at the end, around 1200, 1940, you begin to see these Occitan ports themselves um, becoming dominant players. So for instance, in 1187, um, Conrad of Montferrat uh, granted privileges specifically to Saint-Gilles, uh, uh, Montpellier, Nîmes, and Marseille uh, in the city of Tyre. In 1190, Queen Sibylla of Jerusalem with her husband Guy of Lusignan accorded privileges throughout the kingdom, uh, specifically to Marseille. And, and she also mentioned um, uh, uh, Saint-Gilles and Montpellier in the same act as, as the sort of rival uh, interests uh, at that time. So a major, a major uptick in the concerns of the trading ports with uh, the fate of the Crusader states. Um, at the same time, uh, moving forward into the 13th century, uh, there were noble families whose members had uh, settled, had established their own lordships in Tripoli uh, and in Antioch, uh, like the Porcelain of Arles. Um, uh, and they continued to maintain their presence, the Lainis, and these families continued to kind of uh, have contacts back uh, in Occitania. So for instance, in this extraordinary uh, way, um, the, the actual documents, the archive of the Porcelain family um, uh, uh, from Arles, the, the documents, the archives that they produced in 
uh, Antioch and Tripoli was actually transported back and we have the surviving documents in their family archive in, in Arles showing this kind of linkage between the two. Um, so, you know, we, I, we now come to the uh, time in the 13th century when the Albigensian Crusade uh, begins to bear down on the Occitan uh, towns and castles. Uh, but even during that period and the long period of war, conquest, inquisition, subjugation that, had, that followed, um, trade and familial links between Occitania and the Crusader states continued. They didn't stop uh, because of, of the Albertans and Crusade. Uh, and in fact, um, in an interesting uh, turn of events, uh, taking the cross to crusade in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, became one of the accepted ways for Occitan lords to prove that ultimately they were, they had abjured uh, any heretical beliefs they were believed to hold, or they were, uh, that they were no longer disloyal uh, to the King of France. Um, so for instance, uh, when Oliver, uh, the Lord of the castle of Tarn, um, uh, finally, after years of uh, fighting against the French uh, forces in Occitania, when he finally surrendered to King Louis IX in the year 1246, uh, part of the condition of his surrender was that he agreed to join the king on crusade uh, to Egypt. Uh, and notably for Oliver, uh, this was one of four crusade expeditions to the Eastern Mediterranean that he would undertake. Um, so having been defeated by crusaders, Oliver became a crusader. The two were completely linked together in his experience. Um, and of course, after the golden age of Occitan lyric had ended, um, the body of lyric poetry and the associated texts like the Vitas and Razzos, as they were transmitted in the great songbooks, they represented a great storehouse of memory about the Crusades of the High Middle Ages, recording what appear to be uh, contemporary reactions to important developments in the political and military history of the Crusades, um, recording the development of vernacular lay attitudes toward crusading, like we've seen in uh, um, Pax in Nomine Domini by Mark Brew, this important uh, monument to the understanding of crusading ideology in the middle of the 12th century. Um, and they also recorded meditations on the effects of the crusading experience uh, on different communities in the Mediterranean world, as we'll see again with our reading uh, for this week. Um, and we can address all of those things. You know, what, what is in that storehouse of memory about the Crusades that's, that's in the lyric tradition? Um, we can discuss all of that in, in class this week, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts and reactions. See you in class. <laughs>